And I wanted to read a scene early in the book um, where they've had a problem with rattlesnakes biting the workers. And uh, um, nobody can figure out what to do. And Serena is the one that uh, finally comes up with the solution. And uh, one of the things I love doing, and, I, and I, one reason I wanted to be here, uh, is that I love history. I think that's clear if, you know, from here, if, if you've read any of my work, I think you know that. Uh, and I had probably more fun doing research on this book than any book I've uh, ever uh, done. And, and one thing I found, and I suspect all of you know this, is you want to find the fanatics. Those are the people that give you the best stuff. Uh, uh, you know, I was trying to find out about a Shea engine that was used in a timber camp, and I, I tracked down this guy. And he, uh, he, was, he, he treated me as if I were the village idiot. I mean, they, they're, these people are always very condescending. And, and I'm not afraid to make a fool of myself, so I just ask these questions. And uh, this guy made it very clear I would never understand the, uh, the complexities of the Shea engine, but he would dumb it down for me a little bit. But also, uh, the most interesting guy I talked to was um, uh, one of three people in the United States who hunts with a particular creature. And I spent several weeks talking to him, uh, getting photographs, and uh, that was really good background for this scene. The eagle arrived in December. Serena had notified the depot master it would be coming and must be brought immediately to camp. And so it was. The six-foot wooden crate and its inhabitant placed on a flat car with two youths in attendance. The train making its slow ascent from Waynesville as if bringing a visiting dignitary. With the eagle came two small leather bags, and one was a thick gauntlet of goat skin to cover the forearm from wrist to elbow, and the other the leather hood and jesses and swivels and a leash. That and a single piece of rag paper that may have been instructions or a bill or even a warning, but written in a language the depot master had never seen before but suspected was Comanche. The conductor of the train that brought the bird to Waynesville disagreed, telling of the strange man who'd accompanied the bird from Charleston to Asheville. Hair black as a crow's feather and wearing a dress so bright blue it hurt your eyeballs to look at it long, the conductor told the men at the depot. And a pointy fur hat, plus a sword on his belt nigh tall as he was, it gave a fellow pause about making sport of the dress he wore. <laughs> no siree, the conductor declared. That wasn't one of our Indians. Bird's arrival was an immediate source of rumor and speculation, especially among one of the crews. The men had come out of the dining hall to watch the two boys lift their charge off the flat car. The youth solemn and ceremonious as they carried the crate to the stable. Dunbar believed the creature would be used as a messenger in the manner of a homing pigeon. McIntyre cited a verse from Revelations, while Stewart suggested the Pemberton's had planned to fatten up the bird and eat it. Ross suggested the eagle had been brought in to pick out the eyes of any worker who closed them on the job. Snipes uncharacteristically ventured no theory about the creature's purpose, though he did give a lengthy discourse on whether or not men could fly if they had feathers on their arms. Serena had the youths place the eagle in the back stall where Campbell had built a block perch of wood and steel and sizzle rope. Serena then dismissed the two boys and they walked out of the stable side by side each matching his stride to his fellows. They marched back to the waiting train and climbed onto the flat car and sat with legs crossed and faces shorn of expression, much in the manner of the Buddha. Several workers gathered around the car inquiring of the eagle and its purpose. The youths ignored, youth, youths ignored all of them. Only when the wheels turned beneath them did the two boys allow themselves tight-lipped, condescending smiles aimed at lesser mortals who would never be entrusted as the guardians of things original and rare. Serena and Pemberton remained in the stable, observing the eagle from outside the stall door. The bird's head was covered with a leather hood, and its immense yellow talons gripped the block perch inside the crate. The six-foot wingspan pressed tight to the body motionless. But Pemberton sensed the eagle's power as he might an unsprung coil of wrought iron, especially in the talons, which stabbed deep into the block perch's hemp. The talons looked particularly powerful, Pemberton noted, especially the longer one at the back of the foot. 
That's the hallux talon. It's strong enough to pierce a human skull, Serena said. Or as more often occurs, the bones of a human forearm. Serena did not raise her eyes from the eagle as she reached out and took Pemberton's hand. But even in the barn's dim light, he could see the intensity in her gaze. Serena's thin eyebrows arched as if to allow her vision to take in as much as the eagle as possible. This is what we want, she said, her voice deepening. The emotion so often controlled fully unbridled now. To be like this always, like the bird, no past or future, pure enough to live totally in the present. Serena's shoulders shuddered as if to cast off an unwanted cloak draped over her. Her face reassumed, reassumed its look of measured placidity, the intensity not drained from her body but spread to a wider surface. They did not speak again until Serena's horse shifted in its stall at the front of the barn. Remind me to tell Vaughn to move the Arabian into the stall next to this one, Serena said. The bird needs to get used to the horse. When you train the eagle, Pemberton asked, you starve her, then what? She weakens, weakens enough to take food from my glove, Serena said. But it's when she bows and bares her neck that matters. Why, Pemberton asked. Because it shows the bird surrendered? No, Serena said. That's, when she, that's where she's most vulnerable. It means she trusts me with her life. How long will that take? Two, perhaps three days. When will you start, Pemberton asked. This evening. It was mid-July when Serena freed the eagle from the block perch and rode west to Fork Ridge where Galloway and his crew worked on the near slope. The day was hot and many of the men worked shirtless. They did not cover themselves when Serena appeared for they'd learned she didn't care. Serena loosed the leather laces and removed the eagle's hood, then freed the leash from the bracelets. She raised her right arm. As if performing some violent salute, Serena thrust her forearm and the eagle upward. The bird ascended and began a dihedral circle over the 20 acres of stumps behind Galloway's crew. On the third circle, the eagle stopped. For a moment, the bird hung poised in the sky, seemingly outside the world's slow turning. Then it appeared not so much to fall, but to slice open the air. Its body veed like an axe head as it propelled downward. Once on the ground among the stumps and slash, the eagle opened its wings like a flourished cape. The bird wobbled forward, paused, and moved forward again, the yellow talons sparring with some creature hidden in the slash. In another minute, the eagle's head dipped, then rose with a hank of stringy pink flesh in its beak. Serena opened her saddlebag and removed a metal whistle and a lariat. Fastened to one end of the hemp was a piece of bloody beef. She blew the whistle and the bird's neck whirled in her direction as Serena swung the lure overhead. They lord God, a worker said, as the eagle rose. For in its talons was a three-foot-long rattlesnake. The bird flew toward the ridge crest then arced back drifting down towards Serena and Galloway's crew. Except for Galloway, the men scattered as if dynamite had been lit, stumbling and tripping over stumps and slash as they fled. The eagle settled on the ground with an elegant awkwardness, the serpent still writhing, but its movements only a memory of when it had been alive. Serena dismounted and offered the goblet of meat. The bird released the snake and pounced on the beef. When it finished eating, Serena placed the hood back over the eagle's head. Can I have the skin and rattles, Galloway asked. Yes, Serena said, but the meat belongs to the bird. 